Okay, today we're going to talk about muscles. Uh, and of course, the, the muscles uh, control most of the locomotion. Uh, they, they control the legs of the insect, they control the wings of the insect, and so I'm going to sort of couple those together in, in this one lecture. Now, I'll be brutally honest with you, uh, it's tough for me to teach about muscle action. Uh, just like it is with, with genetics and some other things, we know a great deal of the intimate details of what goes on in our uh, genetic system. We know a great detail in the, the, uh, the goings on uh, and the uh, uh, muscular system. Uh, and uh, it's, I find it interesting, the muscular system is actually very intimately attached to the nervous system. Why? Well, you need nerves to fire off the muscles. And, and so uh, you're, we've already talked about these reflex loops where there are sensors that are directly interconnected to the flexor muscles that, that will uh, respond to whatever stimulus uh, has been received. And, and we've talked about that. You have that kind of a system also. Uh, if, if you're not paying attention and, and something happens, you, you get uh, uh, a, uh, a pin poked in you or something jabs you, uh, you immediately respond to that uh, in a reflex action. Uh, when you, you uh, receive heat stimulus, you, you get into a reflex action there. Now, today I'm going to show you some of the details of muscle contraction. Uh, but the, the best way for me to do this is like I did with genetics. I'm going to show you some videos of that. And again, all I really want you to know, I, uh, there, there's going to be a whole slew of terms that are going to be thrown at you uh, in those videos. What I really want you to understand is that we do know the, the real finite biochemical details of muscular contraction and how it occurs and, and uh, uh, so I, again I want you to know that it's complicated but let's face it you can if you're ever required to have those details you can look it up uh, but I, I want you to get a feeling and an understanding of how muscles operate. Now to begin with there are different muscle types. The muscles that we see in something like a, a jellyfish are not the kind of muscles that we see. Did you see any red in the jellyfish videos? No. Uh, and the reason for that is, is that they use muscles that don't have red blood cells associated with them. The reason why most of your muscles are red, now you do have some other muscles that are white that are more closely related to what you would find in, in something like an echinoderm, a starfish, or, or a sea urchin. Uh, and, and those are what we call smooth muscles. And, and these are muscles that don't have a great deal of vascularization. In other words, a lot of blood capillaries in them. And so when you see them, these muscles actually appear white or clear. Uh, now, they, in, in life, they appear clear. Uh, when you cook them, uh, in, in other words, denature the proteins in them, they would then turn a uh, sort of a whitish or creamish color uh, to them. Basically, we have three types of muscles. Two types of the muscles, if you take a look at them under the microscope, appear to have these very regular bands across them, and, and those are called striations in there. We'll, we'll explain what those striations are, and basically what they are are the, the proteins in the muscles that are all lined up in a very specific configuration that allow those strands to slide in and out from each other, and, and so that would be the contraction uh, and the relaxation of the muscle, and, and we can easily see that. Smooth muscles basically don't have that nice, neat organization of those proteins, and so you don't see striations uh, in them. But what we find is that uh, in us, our smooth muscles are mainly what's found in your gut. So whenever you have a stomach cramp, uh, it's, it's usually very long and very intense. And that's what we find is smooth muscle, muscle operates and contracts very slowly but it contracts very intensely. Uh, women know this very well because there, there's a lot of smooth muscle in the uterine lining. Uh, 
And, and so when you've got uh, menstruation cramps and things like that, uh, it's, it's very intense. We guys can't understand that because uh, we don't experience it. But I, I've had muscle cramps in my stomach uh, and, and in my intestines. So I can just imagine what it would be like to, to have that going on in, in other areas. Now in insects, it's kind of interesting, in the insect world, all of their muscles are striated. So all of their muscles react very quickly, and they contract very quickly, and then they can uh, uh, stop contracting. They can relax very quickly. However, they're packed together in slightly different configurations. Uh, they're, they're primarily uh, what we call a, a tubular. Uh, that means that the, the muscle strands are, are uh, arranged uh, in, in these bundles uh, and, and tubes, and, and ours don't have that. Now, what's the difference between striated skeletal and striated cardiac? Again, I'll show you some examples of these. The skeletal muscles are generally long fiber striations that are pretty well lined up together. The cardiac muscle, on the other hand, uh, the fibers of those are all interconnected, almost like a mesh network. And you can imagine having a mesh network that when it contracts would be a good thing to have in your heart because you don't want your heart to just contract from one end to the other. You want the, that to squeeze together and, and force the blood out of the heart. And, and so we, we believe that's why we have that uh, uh, cardiac muscle that, that really acts sort of as a meshwork that can, can squeeze that bulbous thing together uh, and push the, the uh, uh, blood out of there. To give you some, uh, some diagrams of these, uh, uh, here's the skeletal muscles, and again, those would be the, the striated skeletal muscles. These are the ones that are virtually in, in all of your appendages. It's, uh, it's what makes my mouth move uh, and so forth. The, these are the, the ones that are, again, in long fibers. Uh, long strands. There, there are muscle bundles bundled together uh, in those, but again, they're bundled in such a manner that when you look at them under the microscope from the side, you see these distinctive bands, and we'll talk about those bands uh, in a minute. When it comes to the cardiac muscle, again, we see the striations in there, but I think you can see that now, instead of having these nice long bundles of muscle fibers, there's this interconnection. There, there's this sort of a, a network, a meshing uh, of those fibers that uh, allow for a different type of contraction, especially uh, in your heart where that's needed. When it comes to the smooth muscles of ours, uh, smooth muscles are, are generally smaller fibers. Uh, there's more, uh, as you can see, more nuclei and, and more cells uh, interconnected, and, and we don't see the striations that we saw. The, the contractile elements inside of those uh, muscle fibers are not all lined up together, so you don't see the striations. Now, they contract in the same manner, but uh, they, they contract uh, with, with a whole bunch of interconnecting uh, uh, protein uh, contractile elements. When we take a look at, at uh, the, the muscles, uh, the striations actually come from uh, a set of, of uh, uh, microfibrils that, that are in there. Uh, and each one of those microfibrils uh, consists of, of myosin filaments and actin filaments. And when these are all lined up together, uh, we call these sarcomeres. Sarco is, is uh, uh, the, the uh, body and, and mere, uh, meaning the, the uh, muscle uh, that's in there. Now, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to go through all of the details uh, to try to explain this to you because it's much easier for me to show you what I consider to be some really good videos uh, of this. So. stimulates the muscle, what in the insect muscle contracts? The entire muscle fiber. And so we have these insects that have these definite bundles inside of their, uh, in, in, uh, their, their body. And so every time one of their muscle contracts, that muscle contracts completely.
And that's quite different than ours. Our, ours have what we consider to be uh, an innervation that can allow only partial contraction of the muscle to complete contraction. It just depends on the, the number of nerves that are fired off and the number of nerves that cause contraction. So very different. What were some of the molecules that were involved in that contraction? There was one molecule specifically that I, I'm thinking of, uh, an elemental molecule. You probably didn't think about it that much. Calcium, absolutely. Uh, and again, I think this is this is missed. We we often associate calcium with our bones and teeth, and indeed, calcium is important in there. But calcium is extremely important in your muscle contraction. As a matter of fact, my wife with with her arthritis uh, suffers from cramps, uh, leg cramps, and, and skeletal cramps uh, on, on a fairly regular basis. And and of course, what I was assuming is, is that they would put her on a potassium because we always talk about uh, you need to eat more potassium if you've got cramps. And then what, it, what is the potassium actually involved in? Uh, did you hear potassium in there? No. But previously we talked about potassium in nerves. Remember nerves are uh, very dependent on sodium and potassium and the balance of those. So when you get a cramp at night, why did you get a cramp at that? Well, it could be that they, the nerves fired off and couldn't stop. And so potassium is important for that. But your muscle contraction itself is largely dependent on the flow of calcium in and out of those muscles. <clears throat> now, another thing that wasn't illustrated in here uh, is that insects have an interesting system, which are called rhinidine receptors. And basically what these rhinidine receptors is that they are packets inside of those muscle bundles that contain calcium. And that's, a, uh, that's something that we've only learned just in the last few years, uh, that, that uh, the configuration of where calcium is in the insect muscle is inside the fibers. Our calcium is on the outside of our muscle bundles. And so when the calcium comes into your muscles, it has to come in from the outside uh, and again, there's these gating mechanisms that allow the calcium to come in. That causes a contraction of the muscles. Then the muscles physiologically remove that calcium. That allows for then the, the, the relaxation of those bundles. For insects, that calcium is on the inside. And, and this has become very important recently because we now have rhinidine disruptor insecticides. What in the world does that mean? Well, what that means is that when that insect picks up this disruptor insecticide, it causes all of their rhinidine packets to release their calcium, and insects basically die of contraction. Uh, all their muscles contract at the same time. They can't relax, and, and so they get overstimulated. Their heart can't beat. Uh, the, they can't move and, and so forth. But it has no effect on us because we don't have those rhinidine packets in our muscles. So this is a new category of insecticides that have been recently uh, developed that are practically non-toxic to us and our relatives, meaning birds, fish, reptiles, amphibians, all the ones that have our kind of muscle, but they can be very deadly to the arthropods that have those rhinidine receptors. Okay. Now, again, I don't expect you to remember all those details other, other than there's these two fibers, actin and myosin. In the presence of calcium, they use energy to slide those fibers together, contraction. In the, the removal of the calcium, they allow those, those fibers to uh, relax and, and go to their original state. Now, we indicated to you that uh, these are some really ancient uh, they, these are actually some old woodcut uh, illustrations that, that were made in the, the early 1800s. When we had first discovered some microscopes, uh, there, were, there were a whole bunch of uh, uh, scientists, I guess we would call them scientists now, that, that were saying, uh, we've discovered this whole microbial world, this, this little microcosm, take a look at it. And, and so they were, there were some scientists back in the 1800s that actually cut over some insects and looked on the inside of their bodies. And they said, wow, this is pretty complicated. And, and so here's a cockroach that's been dissected, and you can see the muscles. And what I really want you to notice is that notice the muscles are, again, in these bundles. 
that there are specific bundles in here. The, the, if you take a look at the uh, here, you can see now, now this is obviously the ventral area. I can see the ventral nerve cord here. So I can see these vent, these uh, uh, muscle bundles running from one segment of the abdomen to the other segment of the abdomen. So when those contract, what that's going to do is that's going to slide those segments together. Now, remember that you can bend the segments, uh, but, but you can't stretch them. So basically what they do is they, when those muscles uh, uh, contract, it sort of slides those segments uh, uh, among each other. You can also see specific muscle bundles uh, in here that operate the wings and the legs and, and other structures. Now, here would be the, the dorsal uh, area, and you can see in the dorsal area uh, the, the muscles in the back now of the insect or, or, or even in more distinct bundles. You can also see some interesting uh, bundles of muscles running here in each one of the segments running to the dorsal vessel. And those would be the muscles that when they contract, they can pull the dorsal vessel apart, and when they relax, the dorsal vessel can go together. And so that's how the dorsal vessel would actually be pumping blood. Uh, the, the contraction and expansion of those muscles would be operating those. <clears throat> those are basically the, the, the ventral and dorsal uh, muscle bands. But then there are also bands of muscles that if we cut through the, uh, the side of the insect that run from the top to the bottom, the dorsal ventral muscles. And again, here you can see the really large muscle bands that are involved in the legs and the wings here in the thorax. There's not all that many muscles, uh, dorsal ventral muscles that are in the abdomen. But if you actually watch a cockroach uh, sitting there, what you will see is, is that the abdomen will often sort of raise and lower, uh, and, and what that's doing is, is sucking air or drawing air into the trachea and into the air sacs that would be located in there. And quite often you will also see that the abdomen might expand out and contract a little bit that way. Uh, and, and again, that would be to increase the volume in there to basically pull air into the trachea and then push uh, the carbon dioxide back out of there. Now, I've talked about the sliding of the, the exoskeleton and moving together and so forth. And so I've got a, my version of a drawing here of what I would envision as the uh, three abdominal segments of an insect. And what I want you to notice here is that the primary segment here actually runs from this invagination to that invagination. In other words, we find out that the exoskeleton does extend in. There, there are these uh, what we call epidemes that stick into the inside of the body, and that's where the muscles attach. And so you can see the muscles are attached to those. But what I wanted to illustrate here is that for each one of the abdominal segments, there is a very rigid part of the exoskeleton that basically can't be bent. Uh, it, it can't be flexed, but then there's a thin part of the exoskeleton that can be bent or flexed. So what I'm going to do is, is try to flex this, uh, the muscles, and let's see what happens. I hope this still works. So there's the original body segments. We have the hardened part, what we call sclerotized, and the flexible part, the non-sclerotized. Do you see it? So when those muscles contract, what it does is it telescopes that together. Okay? So this is kind of neat to me as a, as a system. When that insect molts, what it does is it fills its body with as much air, it sucks in as much water, and it expands the exoskeleton as much as it can. It hardens part of the exoskeleton but leaves some of the exoskeleton bendable, flexible. Can it, it can't be stretched, but it can be bent together. And so as soon as it molts and it's, it's finished that expansion of the exoskeleton, it can exhale the, the, uh, the air that it sucked into the trachea and into the air sacs. It can regurgitate the water that it pulled in to sort of provide more space. And then the body can telescope together. 
So I'll do that again. It would be sclerotized exoskeleton. And when we say sclerotized, we'll talk about this when we talk about the exoskeleton. That means the addition of extra proteins to thicken and harden that part of the exoskeleton. And then the non-sclerotized means that they, we have fewer. There's, there's still some of those proteins in there, but there's fewer proteins that are in there, and it allows the exoskeleton to, to bend and flex. You still can't stretch it, but at least you can bend it. And so in this particular case, you're, you're seeing when that muscle contracts from this one hardened area to that one hardened area, this soft area flexes in. And, and look how much volume is saved by that. When, uh, you can see the total volume here, but when I flex that, you can see the volume is much less. And, and so uh, when, when an insect is, is uh, just molted, uh, those muscles will, will sort of telescope those segments together. But as it feeds and begins to build up the fat body and the body mass on the inside of that, it will untelescope the abdomen. Now, to me, this is an important thing. I can tell you when an insect is about ready to molt. Can you imagine how I can tell that? I can start to see the, and typically this unsclerotized part of the exoskeleton is also lightly pigmented. And so I can start seeing more and more little bands of lightly pigmented exoskeleton. That means that that abdomen is being stretched and filled up. And so the insect is probably going to molt fairly soon. Now, we talked when we first talked a, a little bit about uh, muscles and, and contraction and, and function, that we talked about the, uh, where are the muscles that are operating my fingers? They're up here in my forearm. And so how do they operate that? Well, the muscles actually, the muscle bands come down uh, into uh, a very tight uh, uh, connective tissue, which we call a ligament. And it's really the ligaments that go down and actually attach to the bones themselves. So when this muscle contracts up here, it pulls on that ligament and that pulls and, and flexes my muscle or my, my bones together down here. Now, how do you do this if you've got an exoskeleton on the outside? Well, it's pretty much the, the, the same way, but the flexing would be a, a little bit different. So in essence, for each body segment, uh, in this case, if I've got a leg segment like the, the femur right here, to move the tibia, what I would have is the muscles are actually in the femur, and there would be the equivalent of a ligament that goes down into the, the tibia, and when that muscle contracts, it pulls on that ligament. And if this muscle contracts here, it's going to pull that femur in. On the other hand, if I've got another one, and notice that this muscle is a little bit smaller, what that's going to do is pull the leg back out. And so, uh, again, we would call the, these adductor muscles, uh, the, the ones uh, that, that uh, pull your muscles in. And we're really not all that much different. If you think about it, in your forearm, in your uh, upper arm here, uh, which one is the bigger muscle? Is it the one on the top or the one on the bottom? Or actually, if I were laying down prone, it would be uh, actually the dorsal muscle that's in here is the one that really pulls in, and you have less muscles that, that go out. Now, bodybuilders know this, and so they spend a lot of time trying to develop these other muscles that are usually smaller. And so if you see a bodybuilder, they're, they're going to be doing a lot of, of strange-looking lifting in order to develop the, those other muscle masses that normally aren't as large as the ones that, that you need to grab a hold and, and hold on to something. Now we took a look at, at walking. Uh, of the insect in the laboratory. What did we say was the configuration of walking with the insect? It's a triangular uh, that they use the, the foreleg and the hind leg on one side and the middle leg on the opposite side for that. And I indicated to you that that means that they typically have, they don't you know go bonk, they don't uh, wobble or fall down. Well, I didn't tell you the whole truth in that. In reality, there is a little bit of wobble with the insect. When you use that triangular motion, typically what we find is, is that the, the body wobbles just a little bit. 
with those three legs in, in that configuration, and that's uh, uh, being shown here by the beetle. Now, not all insects use their legs to walk with. Can anybody name what this kind of a caterpillar would be? They're called loopers and inchworms. And in this particular case, uh, they figured out that, you know, if I, if I have to use my, my six legs in, in that triangular motion, I've got this long, skinny abdomen behind me, uh, and, and those segments have those big, fleshy prolegs, I really can't move very fast. So I find it, it kind of interesting that a secondary adaptation in many of the caterpillars is to get rid of those extra prolegs in here and then what I can do is that I can take my body and I can extend it forward. I can put my legs down and, and attach them, and then I can pull my abdomen up in a looping motion. And so I can do this inchworm or looping motion, and I can move a lot faster. Inchworms and loopers move a lot faster than regular caterpillars that have to pick up all of their pro legs and, and move them along in, in sort of a, a, a little uh, uh, wave-like action. Another way to, to get around faster is to jump. Uh, and, and we've talked about several insects. Now, the vast majority of insects use their legs as jumping organs, but we did talk about one group of insect-like organisms that don't use their legs. And do you remember what those were? The little springtails. Uh, remember that springtails don't use their legs to jump. They actually have this furcula. They have this jumping organ that's uh, basically uh, an abdominal appendage that's folded up underneath the abdomen. And when that is contracted, it flips them uh, upright and, and they spring out from that. But the vast majority of insects have jumping legs. And guess which leg is most likely going to be the jumping one? It's the hind leg. Yeah. Uh, and, and so here I've got uh, grasshoppers. Uh, this is actually a flea hopper. Uh, this is a, a true uh, a bug uh, right here, but you can see it's got these enlarged time legs. Uh, here's a plant hopper, and, and this one you can as, again see it's got these really long enlarged hind legs. Here's a flea weevil. Uh, it's a weevil that, that has enlarged hind legs and, and will jump. <clears throat> now, I don't have a flea on here, but if we took a look at a flea, again, it would be the hind legs that are greatly enlarged and used for jumping. What happens when most of, most of these insects jump? If they happen to be a thing like a grasshopper or one of these true bugs, they don't have wings as nymphs. And so, yeah, they probably, when they jump, they just crash. Uh, they may hit it uh, on their, their head, their tail, their side. They may eventually land on their legs, but they usually they upright. However, once they have wings, what we find is, is that the jumping legs are usually used to launch the insect into the air. The wings immediately unfold and they will fly to the next location. So uh, the, the insects like these beetles, only the adult beetles would be able to jump and, and so they would immediately take flight. Uh, from that, but these uh, true bugs and, and the grasshoppers that have nymphs, uh, in, in which they also have jumping hind legs, they really can't jump and fly until they reach adulthood. Good question. Now, there's two types of flight muscles. There are what we call direct flight muscles. In other words, there are actual muscles attached to the base of the wings. And when some of those muscles contract, it causes the wings to, to go up. And then there's another set of muscles that are directly attached to the wing. When they contract, they pull the wing down. Those are what we call direct muscles. The problem with direct muscles is that you can only flap your wings basically as fast as you can contract and relax the muscles. Now that can be pretty fast. If, if you think about it, how fast can you move your finger up and down? You can move that pretty fast. You, you could get, get in uh, probably 150 uh, uh, beats per, per minute uh, doing that. And, and for some insects that have fairly large wings, like a dragonfly or a damselfly, that you can do. <clears throat> now there's another problem that we see with, uh, by the way, uh, in the laboratory that cockroach has direct 
flight muscles. Uh, and it really wasn't, the wings weren't beating all that fast. When we turned on the lights, you can actually see the wings uh, fluttering there. Uh, it wasn't, uh, if, if it were a wasp or a fly, it would just be a blur. You wouldn't really be able to see the wings uh, much at all. Now, we can still stop it with a strobe, uh, but you can't see them very well. Now, what I really wanted to, to show you here, this, this is actually uh, just line illustrations of a dragonfly moving its wings, and what I want you to take a look at is that this is what we call a fluttery flight. And in this particular case, what we're talking about when we say a fluttery flight is that the front wings and the hind wings move out of sync. They don't move together, but they flutter. Now, what did we say was one of the problems with a fluttery flight? Remember, I'm trying to shove air behind me. And so if I've got the front wings going down and shoving air and the hind wings are coming up, what's happening? I get turbulence. And, and the term here is, is turbulence. I get the, the wake of the air of the four wings intercepting the hind wings and we get turbulence. And, and when, the, when we get turbulence, we get instability and lack of precision. And, and so it, it becomes difficult for you to, to have high powered flight when you've got this fluttery type of emotion. Now with that said, I, I find it interesting uh, dragonflies, there's some species of dragonflies that are some of the fastest flyers that we have. How in the world do they accomplish that? We now know that those species actually, while they don't have a coupling mechanism, they actually have the ability to cause the two wings to follow each other. And they get rid of that turbulence and use them basically as one unit, even though they're not attached together. So here's the direct muscles, and, and basically what I've drawn here is a thoracic box. That's the circle in here. There is a top sclerite, that would be a top plate, that is joined to the wings right here with some flexible exoskeleton. And you'll notice that the wings themselves, the bases of the wings extend inside of that box and the bases of those wings are actually attached to muscles. And so I've got one set of muscles in the light pink here that's attached to the, the base of the wing right where it pivots on the side of the exoskeleton. And then I've got some other muscles on the inside that are attached to the inside of that. So what happens is that when these muscles contract, what that does is pull down on this inside lever, and because of the pivot action, that's going to pull the wing up. On the other hand, if these outside muscles that are attached, basically outside of that pivot, contract, that's going to pull the wing down. And, and so that's what we mean by direct flight. I have one set of muscles that causes the wings to go up, and another set of the muscles that cause the wing to, to go down. What's the problem with this? Again. That means that I've got to have that coordination. I've got to have some muscles that are relaxing right at the instant that the other muscles are contracting in, in order to achieve that kind of flight. Most insects that fly fast and very directed have what we call indirect flight musculature. In this particular case, what we see is that we still have that thoracic box in there where I've got the exoskeleton at the top very rigid and I've got the sides and the bottom of the thorax also very rigid and, and sclerotized exoskeleton but now look where the muscles are attached. I really only have one band of muscles that are attached and now they're not actually attached to the wing they're attached to this top plate of the exoskeleton and this bottom of the exoskeleton, so they're they're top uh, to, to the the top, which would, would be the uh, uh, turgite down there, and then the sternite down in the bottom. See what happens when when those muscles contract? Well, when those dorsal ventral muscles contract, what that does is it pulls this plate down, which is attached through some flexible exoskeleton, and because of the pivot, that causes those wings to go up. Now, how do I get my wings down? 
that's a bigger problem. And in this particular case, what happens is that there's also what we call an epideme in front of each one of the segments that extends inside of the body. And, and so I've got this epideme and I now have anterior, posterior muscles that are attached to that. So when I've got the, these two uh, epidemes going in, when they get pulled together, what it does is it domes up that top plate. So now when those muscles contract right here, these relax. When these contract, what that does is it causes that top plate to rise. What's the problem with this, as I've described it? Still sounds like I've got two muscles contracting, causing the wings to go up and down. But guess what happens if I contract both of those muscles at the same time? It's like a tuning fork. What I set up is stress in the exoskeleton in both of those plates. And basically what happens is I, once I start contracting those muscles, I end up with a vibration going on. And I can vibrate basically that upper plate up and down very, very rapidly. And now I can achieve wing beats that far exceed the contraction of a muscle and the relaxation of a muscle. Now, I'm going to try to again show you. Uh, uh, this is my diagram of this, and, and uh, we'll, we'll take a, a look at this. So here's in. in uh, uh, a state where these muscles have contracted and then the wing is up. Okay, do you see that? So when the, these muscle bands in here contract and, and pull that, uh, the epidemes in, that forces the, the top plate of the thoracic up, and then that causes the wings now to pivot down. Yeah, they, they have the fastest wing beats. Uh, and, and this is what you're going to find in, in the primarily the hymenoptera, the bees, wasp, and the diptera. They're, the, they're going to have this indirect flight muscle. Most of the beetles also have indirect flight muscles. So let me show that again. Wow. Yeah, I've been talking about beats per minute and now we're in beats per second. And, and what I wanted to show you is that, remember that I told you that the ones that have the indirect flight muscles are the hymenoptera, so we have a honeybee, bumblebee, hornet in there, the flies, so that would be the housefly. Uh-oh, what's wrong with that? Yeah, it's one word. I'm, I'm gonna have to go back in there and, and correct that. Should be housefly, surfed fly, uh-oh, horsefly, I must. I think I took this from somebody else's list. I'm going to blame it on somebody else, not me, uh, uh, for for doing that. So, uh, but again, just think about that. Uh, and and actually, it was uh, stated uh, many years ago that uh, there were some physicists that measured the the wing uh, uh, space of of a bumblebee and the body mass of the bumblebee, and they said this thing can't fly. And, and no, that's if you use your physics. Uh, but if you beat the wing fast enough, you can take flight. And, and so by having this indirect flight uh, motion, you can see uh, the, that uh, we can achieve these uh, uh, 100 to 200 beats per second uh, in, in flight. On the other hand, uh, the ones that have the in, the, uh, some of the uh, indirect uh, muscles here would be the scorpion fly uh, and the damsel fly, and you can see that those have uh, fairly low uh, uh, beats. Now, having the, the number of beats per second doesn't necessarily translate uh, into speed, and as you can see there, uh, the dragonfly uh, is, is probably the fastest uh, flyer. Uh, that, that can uh, achieve about uh, 15, uh, uh, 16 miles per hour. Uh, and, of course, these ones that have the indirect flight, uh, the little fluttery flight, really are pretty f slow flyers uh, uh, in, in aspect. But I'm here to tell you, when you're trying to, to chase down uh, something like a house fly or a damsel fly, uh, that at least for my age, I, I'm, I'm lucky if I can get up to, to five or six miles per hour uh, in there and, and chase them down.